Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. In addition, I am the host for the Urban Lecture Series, the program you are about to view. Here at Loyola Marymount University, we take pride in having our students engaged in the civic dialogue of Los Angeles. We send our students out to the community, but in addition, through this program, we bring the community to Loyola Marymount University. We hope you are informed by today's program. And for more information about Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and the Urban Lecture Series, please check out our website at lmu.edu backslash CSLA. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series, which is sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. It's also sponsored by the Political Science Department, the Economics Department, the American Cultures Department, and Chicana and Chicano Studies Department. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about labor. Labor in Los Angeles, the history of labor, comparative labor, and we have several guests who have been observers and participants of labor. Uh, we're going to start off with our first two guests. Uh, Immediately to my right is uh, Mr. Wally Knox. He's a former state legislator. He was also on the uh, community college board. Uh, and currently, he is working uh, as Director of External Affairs for the Department of Water and Power, LA Department of Water and Power. And as many as you recall in the previous series, we had quite a bit of discussion with uh, Steve Erie and others about the Department of Water and Power. And the Department of Water and Power has been in the news recently about trying to increase our rates. So as Director of External Affairs, he's going to have a lot of explaining to do. You got and, it. <laughs> and, and we'll, get to, uh, we'll get to some of that. Um, uh, Mr. Knox. Uh, served in the California Assembly representing the 42nd District from 1994 to 2000. In 98, he received the award for outstanding leadership from the Jewish Public Affairs Committee. And as I mentioned before, prior to his election to the Assembly, he was a trustee and president of the Los Angeles Community College District, one of the largest community college districts in the country. Uh, he also served as an attorney specializing in labor relations, and he has owned a small business. Um, he was the first in his family to attend college. He graduated from uh, a little-known university, Harvard University, and Hastings Law School. Um, Harvard University and Harbor University down in San Pedro. I get them confused. But, uh, he also served uh, in Vietnam uh, as well. Uh, next to him is a uh, good longtime friend, uh, Professor Jaime Regalado, who is a professor uh, at Cal State Los Angeles, and more importantly there, he serves as the executive director of the Edmund Pat Brown Institute of Public Affairs, one of the most significant uh, centers for research in California and Los Angeles, almost as significant as the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, he, I knew was, was <laughs> he was previously a professor, uh, uh, um, he specializes, excuse me, in urban politics, state politics, and local politics. He's the founding editor of California Politics and Policy and California Policy Issues Annual. Uh, and he's a former associate editor of the uh, Urban Affairs Review. Um, very highly respected. You will see him commenting on uh, all kinds of issues of, uh, of LA politics in the LA Times, on, on uh, National Public Radio. Uh, anytime you hear anything about uh, LA or labor issues or Latinos in LA, uh, you're sure to hear about uh, uh, a word or two from uh, Jaime Regalado. Uh, let me make a couple of opening statements to kind of contextualize what we're going to talk about for the students, uh, and then we'll get to some questions. What I want to do is really explain to the students uh, and to the audience both the historical and comparative issues uh, uh, in terms of labor in Los Angeles. Uh, we have heard for many years that LA historically was one of the most anti-union cities uh, in, in America. And now we hear that LA is at the vanguard of the labor movement. So quite a distinction historically from being very anti-labor to currently being the one of the most pro-labor uh, uh, cities. Um, and then we've also seen and heard that uh, labor membership in America has declined dramatically. Uh, while we say LA is, is at the vanguard of the uh, labor movement, only about 12% of the workforce in Los Angeles is, is part of a labor union. 12 out of every 100 workers in Los Angeles begun, be, belong to a labor union. In the 60s and 70s, it used to be as high as 20, 22%. So you've seen a decline. 
that's one major trend that I want uh, the audience and students to understand, that there's been a decline of union membership, yet there's been an increase of labor power in Los Angeles, or at least perceived labor power. How do those two kind of uh, coincide, that you're getting less and less memberships, but the power of labor unions in Los Angeles has increased? And then the second trend that I think people need to understand is that for the first time in American history this year, there were more union members who were part of government. That, they, that is, government workers make up now more than half of all union members. So when you think about a union member with a steel hat as a steel worker or as a laborer or as a member of a construction crew or, or uh, at different areas, uh, that's not the, the case. The typical union worker is a police officer, a teacher, uh, a, a public employee. And so that's a, a major uh, change that we've seen. One final observation is that um, in these hard economic times, this recession that we're having, we see the state of California and many other states, not just California. We tend to think that California is the only one that's having this crisis, but in reality, proportionately, many other states are as bad as California. And the city of Los Angeles with a uh, $200 million deficit up to June a, a projected $500 million deficit for the next fiscal year, that is, they're having fiscal trouble. A lot of people are blaming the union contracts that we have and the pensions that we have and are obligated for our public employees. And many in the private sector say, we don't have those same benefits. Um, in other words, there's the whole distinction between a direct benefit pension and a, uh, and a um, direct contribution pension. So a direct benefit pension for you students is one where w the, uh, both the employee and the employer contribute into a fund and that fund guarantees the amount of money you're gonna get when you retire. A direct contribution is where both the employer and the employee uh, also contribute into a fund but you will only get the benefits that are determined by how well that fund does in that investment. So those are some of the observations I wanted to start out with uh, to uh, kind of structure our, our conversation. And it also gives me the opportunity to welcome our, our, our third panelist. And while she is saying her hellos, let me introduce you to her. She is Julie Butcher, the Regional Director of SEIU Local 721. She leads LA, Orange County's largest public sector worker union, representing 80,000 workers and 12,000 in the city of Los Angeles. And she knows every single one of them by a first name basis. She leads her staff in all aspects of representation, including contract negotiations, co coordinating workplace advocacy, as well as successfully bargaining historic agreements with the city of LA, utilizing innovative mutual gains uh, bargaining approach. She also helped build a coalition of city unions representing 22,000 city workers in negotiating strong long-term contracts, some of which I was just uh, discussing. Uh, before acting as the regional director of SEIU 742, uh, Ms. Butch Butcher worked as a union representative, staff director, and then chief strategy for SEIU 347. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Julie Butcher. Okay. Be Sister Butcher. Too. Sister Butcher. All right. We're gonna have to get into the whole. We're gonna have to do a, a UFW a clap at the end of this as well. <clears throat> I think clapping lessons are always in order. Es especially, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, great young activists out here that we can get into involved in terms of union organizing and all of that. Uh, let Let me, Wally, start with you. Okay. Um, you've been around for a long time. You've been a, an observer, a participant of politics. Um, when you think about the labor movement, what are the biggest differences that you see when you first started getting engaged in LA politics and, and now? And then I'll ask the same question of, of uh, Professor Regalado right after that. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for the lead in and thanks for the intro. It's absolutely delightful to be here. I'm so glad you invited me to come by and sit with my friends and talk about this. I was exactly thinking of that topic when you sketched the history that we've lived through and what I'd like to sort of layer on top of that is, um, as, a, as a participant in the union movement for, for 20 years in Los Angeles as a union attorney, what my wife and I both saw happening was we transitioned from a union movement which began in the early 19, in, in my beginning, early 1970s, 
And it was really led by, with all due respect to those folks, a group of old white men smoking a hell of a lot of cigars. So that, you mean like you? <clears throat> that would be me today, yeah. They would, folks would look considerably like me today if I smoked a, a lot of cigars and weighed in maybe at 30 pounds more, something like that. But that was the face of the uh, labor movement in Los Angeles in the 70s, uh, and it was the kind of character of the labor movement in that era also. The, the movement I would uh, summarize, and it would be interesting to get into conversation and see if folks agree, the, the movement has transitioned from that in a couple dramatic ways. The old guard was uh, old white men. It organized with the National Labor Relations Board, with elections and that whole hoo-ha, and has gone through a major transformation now. So you see a lot of young leadership in the union movement today. It is clearly led by a multicultural group of people, women at the helm of major powerful labor organizations unheard of in the 1970s. On top of that, the way it operates has been transformed. It went from going to the National Labor Relations Board and going through this highly legalistic, extremely convoluted procedures into a new way of organizing. And that new way, in, in my perception, was one that was heavily uh, uh, reaching out to the community and heavily working on the political creation of coalitions to assist in the organizing effort. In the 1970s, to use the word coalition building in a union meeting was to get into a fight with the leadership. In the 1990s and today, coalition is at the heart of what I see the union movement doing. And I might speculate that there are things going on in the union movement which are even more controversial, and that is partnerships between employers or employing organizations and unions in ways that would never have been conceived of previously as everyone feels embattled to find jobs, as everyone feels embattled to find revenues to keep everything afloat. Um, the old model of being head to head uh, with labor against management still exists. But in many places you see labor and management trying to figure out how do we both survive together. That's, that's my yeah. thumbnail. Jaime, what's new about organizing? What's new about the unions that we see today? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a kid that grew up in the 1950s in LA, and, and it was a far, far different place uh, than it is now. Uh, did not have an integrated uh, city council uh, until later in the 1950s. It was largely, even though it had nonpartisan elections in the city, it was dominated by conservative Republicans, largely from the Midwest. Uh, unions were notoriously weak, uh, perhaps outside of the construction trade union, and as a, as a kind of a standalone exception. And it was a very forbidding place uh, to many, if not most, people of color. You fast forward that to uh, 2010, it's a radically different place. You see a pl uh, city council, the governing body uh, in the city, and we have a strong council, uh, somewhat weak mayor format, uh, not as weak as he was before some of the charter reforms of about a decade or 12 years ago. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, what we have seen is a remarkable demogra uh, demographic transformation of the city, a city a majority of color. Uh, we've seen that, in a sense, play out ideologically. In other words, it goes from a largely conservative uh, city to a much more liberal one, uh, even rivaling San Francisco. Of course, San Francisco never wanted LA uh, as a com point of comparison, but politically it is comparable. And of course, what we started to see also because of the demographic changes, uh, changes uh, in worker composition, <clears throat> both outside and within unions, were stronger doses of political activity and electioneering, so that you started to see candidates of color, Jewish candidates first, African Americans, and then Latinos sometime later. And all of, almost all of these candidates of color and Jewish candidates were politically liberal, ideologically liberal. Uh, they tended to vote along with labor issues, on lab on, excuse me, with labor on labor issues. And it became a kind of sea change politically for the city at large. And for the first time in memory, and I'm talking about my grandfather's memory, my grandmother's memory, my dad's memory, you had a city council that largely was reflecting 
not only the diversity out in the population, but also the political will uh, and labor had a seat at the table, along with business, almost as co-equals for the first time. And this largely is in the Bradley administration, five terms as mayor, 20 years, never happened again. But we started to see the changes in the 1970s when you started to uh, do your great work. Was there one event, one symbolic person, something that when you think about when the change occurred, when, when was it? Well, I have to say it was the election of Bradley. Um, it really became a different type of administration. Uh, one that was reaching out to labor, was reaching out to communities of color, uh, started to reach out and to battle with uh, the police force here in Los Angeles that was not hospitable to how it dealt with or integrated itself into uh, the daily concerns of communities of color. Yet every police officer is a member of a union. Uh, yet every police officer is a member in Los Angeles that is the, of the Police Protective League. But for a long time, that wasn't welcomed in the House of Labor at the County Fed. And they, they in fact, kept distant from the House of Labor until perhaps about, what, 10 years ago? Uh, so a little bit different uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a union there. Julie, uh, Jaime and myself are academics. We get paid to just kind of reflect and really not practice. Hey. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Wally's certainly been a, a political observer. You are a practitioner of labor. You have to organize. You have to deal with daily mundane issues. Explain to the students what you not do. Not that mundane. Well, when I'm thinking about administration and, and dealing with 12,000 uh, people about all kinds of different, uh, 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 yeah. Explain what you do. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but, but let me say to a room full of young folks that organizing is for the first time in any of our lifetimes a growth industry. So um, I encourage you, um, and you're absolutely work right, the, the work of the Los Angeles labor movement has really moved to the streets. And so I am a practitioner of the streets, so we will teach you how to do the union clap. Um, and, and really the question about kind of who's gonna train the next generation of organizers now that the farm workers is not training organizers. Um, the labor management work that we've done in the city of Los Angeles is, is sometimes looks like an increase in cooperation. It's really based on the presumption that the people doing the work have the best idea about how to get that work done. Uh, anybody ever have a situation where you're at work and you know how something should happen and you don't have the wherewithal to get done your job and provide the kind of service that you know you need to provide. Anybody ever had that situation? Because that's, that's where unions live, um, and certainly public sector unions. And so, yeah, we talk a lot of trash because we represent trash guys. When I started working for the, for the union, the men that were the trash workers in Los Angeles, there were, in 1981, 1,082 trash men. The last time that there was a general strike of trash workers in the city of Los Angeles was in 1981, and there were a, almost 1,100 men, and they were all men, picking up our trash. When I started working for the union, those guys didn't used to retire. They used to die. Um, we had a needle stick policy where they used to, anybody old enough to remember the old time watching men pick up trash by hand? Um, and it used to be that they had leather chaps on the side of their legs because when they were swinging trash, they didn't know what was going to stick them and what was in what was going to stick them. Um, literally, those are the kinds of changes that the workers that do that work have advocated for. Um, and so now where there were um, close to 1,100 men picking up trash 20 years ago, um, 30 years ago, I can date myself, which is um, the only way we get dates these days, um, there are now 593 not all men um, and we pick up more trash in the city of Los Angeles. We divert more trash away from landfill than any other big city in this country. And those workers are proud of that. And so we believe that not only does working together work and it's the only thing that works, but literally that workers have to be advocates for their own services, for their own jobs. Um, that's how we grow to the, to the leap of electing our bosses. Because in the public sector, many, many years ago, um, we could ask a room full of workers like this, how many people here work for government? And people would sort of look at you like, Oh yeah, I guess I do. Well, the fact is, is that city workers, these jobs are the last middle class jobs, particularly for workers of color, particularly for workers of color without college degrees. And so a trash man in the city of Los Angeles makes a middle class wage. Anybody got a problem with that? Middle class wage, family benefits administered through Kaiser, um, nothing Cadillac about it, solid middle class jobs, pick up trash every day, um, these guys used to actually get off early because if you were picking up 14 tons of trash 
every day by hand. You needed to go home and rest your body so you could come back and do it again the, the following day. Um, those are the changes that have happened as a result of folks speaking on their own behalf. Um, advocating for their own work. So I think in terms of the changes in the, in the labor movement in Los Angeles, you're right, I'm a practitioner. Um, I don't have the numbers, I don't have the academics of it. Um, but this year, 2,000 city engineers and professionals uh, voted to change unions and to be with SEIU, to be represented by a, a, a loud union. Um, those are professionals, and so one of the most fun experiences of my life has been to watch engineers, professionals, um, typically not members of unions, very politically conservative, very personally um, shy and conservative. And so to watch them come out and do job actions, and, and so um, a, a bunch of them last week went, um, we had a little uh, anti-Oscar party across the street from the mayor's house. Um, and about half the folks that showed up were engineers, and the other half were librarians, and there'll be some couplings of engineers and librarians. It'll be very interesting in the future. Um, but many of them had never participated in anything before. And so, um, and so to watch them literally come into their own voices. Um, and whatever happens in the future, once folks have experienced the ability to speak on their own behalf, they just never go back. They never change back to looking at their own shoes. Um, and, and so I think that really is the so hope. You guys were in front of the mayor's house during the Oscars, but he was at the Oscars. I saw him at the red carpet. This was the Thursday night. We had a little yeah. city services on the red carpet. So explain to me, I hear about SEIU, AFL, CIO, HERE, 374742. <laughs> what, I mean, it's like an alphabet soup when we're talking about labor. How do I keep that straight? Is there an organizational chart? Is there a secret handshake? I mean, I can do well, it on the back of, an, of a napkin, but I don't well, want to do that for political candidates. The overarching, the American Federation of Labor, CIO stands for, anybody? Somebody here must know what CIO. The AFL-CIO is the overarching. Chief Information it's, Officer. No. 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 Oh. no. It's the, it's the um, affiliation. Basically, unions are each individual unions, and then, and then somehow, in some form or fashion, come together in a variety. You hear in Los Angeles, it's called the County Fed. It's the County Federation of Labor. In other counties, that's called the Central Labor Committee or, or CLCs. You hear different kinds of. All of those are really just uh, uh, associations, affiliations of large numbers of unions all together. SEIU, for instance, is the largest union in the country. It stands for the Service Employees International Union. We're divided into, I don't know, 300 locals nationally. Um, there is no rhyme or reason to the numbers, except that Local 1 was the first one. Um, after that, it seems to lose So the any. numbers don't go by region, they've just some, go. Some unions actually have some system to how they number unions. Um, I think the important thing to remember is that you gotta make somebody explain when they use acronyms in front of you, that you have to explain it, because it's not another language. And so how many, um, we, we earlier talked about that there's actually a declining number of union membership in America, and that hit Los Angeles as well, although Los Angeles has stabilized. It's one of the few areas where you actually have grown a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, how has that growth occurred? Um, I think that growth has occurred on the streets and by lots and lots of very unusual and very unique organizing. And, and you're right, not in the typical uh, NLRB election. Um, I think it's been more um, uh, non-traditional organizing. For instance, um, the organizing of home health care workers um, was the largest unionization uh, drive um, after Flint, Michigan um, in, our, in our lifetimes. And that was the folks that provide in-home care to keep people out of nursing homes, um, stay in their home. The, of course, the difficulty of organizing 100,000 workers that have no work site um, and really report to where they serve the, the patient, the client, um, is a, obviously an organizing challenge um, met by increased technology and lots and lots, literally hundreds of mostly young organizers um, willing to work that hard and with that kind of passion. Um, I think we've figured out uh, uh, different organizing models, um, again, representing um, in the city of Los Angeles, we represent um, the uh, city attorneys, and so you can imagine representing a, a, the largest municipal law firm in this country. Um, and so if you have 600 attorneys, you have probably 1,200 opinions on any given um, thought. We also represent managers, and so it's also folks that are not traditionally thought of as the typical union members. Um, uh, my particular local was born out of LA's trash man. Um, and that's where we start, and that's sort of where our heart is. But we now represent literally thousands of folks that do professional work, administrative work, um, the, the work that's typically not thought of as being done by union members. But the fact is, is that any, anybody individually trying to deal with their own boss understands that you're better off 
banding with the other people you work with and facing the boss together. And that's really the simple basis of it. So we are here at Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series, sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have with us a couple of guests talking about uh, unions and uh, labor in Los Angeles, Ms. Julie Butcher, Mr. Wally Knox, and uh, Professor Jaime Regalado. Um, Jaime, there's been a lot of discussion lately about how powerful unions have become in Los Angeles. What does that mean, and how do they become powerful? And if, from your perspective, are they powerful? Oh, there's no question about that. I, I think one of the transformations we've seen in LA politics has to do deal with the economy, with coalitions, collaborations, but the absolute uh, leadership void in terms of business. Uh, when Bradley was around and before Bradley, you had a crystal core of leading business, men and women, primarily men at the time, uh, who are the drivers, the drivers of politics, drivers of most policy issues, who determine many of the outcomes. Uh, they came to be known at one time as a committee of 14, then the committee of 25. Uh, Fernando, Fernando and I have both written about them in our, our previous lives, in previous years. But you don't have that any longer. So in part, there's a void there that labor could easily step into if it was doing the kind of things that Wally and especially Julie were talking about, and that is organizing. And when Miguel Contreras became uh, the chief of the county fed, the executive secretary treasurer of the county federation of labor. So that's the top person in labor in LA county. And the top uh, labor person in LA county by far. He's not called president, he's not called, he's called no, secret it's secretary treasurer. And typically with many unions, secretary treasurer is a top position. And if there's a president to see, that's the secondary position. Uh, but nevertheless, with Miguel, there was something different that was taking place because labor had historically back candidates and given money to them, but didn't run its own candidates, in other words, from the House of Labor. But it also hoped, and they had a scorecard over the years, like other interest groups do as well, uh, to ensure that the uh, candidates they gave, money, they gave money to who were elected uh, would vote on the right side of labor issues uh, at least two-thirds of the time. A majority was not good enough, at least two-thirds of the time. 100% was aimed for. But when Miguel became executive secretary treasurer uh, about 15 years ago, uh, he wanted warriors, a warrior class of politicians. Not simply, was not simply good enough to back those who would back labor's agenda, that's important. But he also saw fit that he would be incubating, if you will, and running candidates from different houses, some in the county fed. Uh, Fabian Nunez was one example. He was the COPE director, the political director. Uh, Martin Ludlow before him. Had, the students oh, and got Fabian Nunez ended up being in the state assembly, becoming speaker of the state assembly, and then Martin Ludlow ended up uh, at the LA City Council. And uh, LA City Council, then he became, for just a short period, uh, the chief of the LA uh, County Fed as well. Uh, but John Pettis, uh, the new assembly uh, speaker who succeeded Karen Bass, uh, comes out of the labor movement. Others that have been very closely uh, integrated uh, into the movement without being uh, actual uh, union members, perhaps, are like Karen Bass, uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, warriors, in other words. And so that was different. We started to see a sea change in what labor was doing, even with elected officials. I'll end on this point. I know I'm taking long here. But uh, a few years ago, Hilda Solis, uh, who had been in the California Assembly, and then elected successfully to the California Senate, decided she was gonna challenge a sitting congressional official by the name of Matthew Marty Martinez. Well, a problem was that Marty Martinez, even though he was kind of a bad politician, not a good politician, but <laughs> at, at anyway, uh, Hilda decided that she was gonna challenge this incumbent House member. And remember, if you're in the House of Representatives or in the National Senate, there are no, no term limits. So those are the kind of choice seats that don't come around very often. Hilda decided she was gonna challenge Marty Martinez, a sitting congressman, uh, who had a good voting record on labor. Not great, but good. And here, this is where the warrior versus good class of elected official came in. Uh, the county fed, in its leadership, decided that it would back Hilda, back the warrior, uh, hopefully who would oust the good voting member, who was a jerk. But, but nevertheless, but in uh, D.C., the unions in D.C. though did back Marty Martinez, right? They could have, but they were the they were the losing vote. Right, uh, became really uh, very contentious, uh, 
and it wasn't uh, unanimous here in Los Angeles uh, County either. But nevertheless, that was kind of a hallmark of what was taking place in a shift and how politics would be seen, how candidates would be supported and run uh, under the leadership of Miguel Contreras, who uh, died unexpectedly about, what, four or five years ago? I can't, yeah. As I get older, one year seems like 10 years sometimes, but, and um, uh, 2001 was it? So, Wally, we, we talked a little bit about the 1950s and 60s. We talked, to, uh, um, Jaime mentioned about how there was this committee of 25 that informally governed LA. Um, now many believe that the unions are very much informally governing LA. If it was bad, or if it looked bad that this committee of 25 was governing LA, is it bad or does it look bad that this uh, uh, committee of labor people, including Julie Butcher down there, is governing LA? Is that bad? You're always gonna have people complain about uh, leadership, um, but a city needs leadership. Um, when it's provided, some folks will disagree and, and will buck you on that. That's part of the process. Well, what? Will buck you. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> the second thing that goes is, uh, is here. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's part of the contentiousness of politics. Uh, Harry Truman famously said, if you can't stand the heat, get out of politics. Um, I think it was the kitchen. It was the, it was the kitchen, oh, okay. but I was, I was switching it just to be clever oh, there. And you were switching um, just like Jaime was switching that other word. <laughs> this is a city that we know has enormous problems facing it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the problems this LA faces currently with budgets and what have you are not gonna go away in the next six months. I'm sure Julie is well aware of this. And those problems, when eventually surmounted, will not be succeeded by a golden era, which will be a perfect utopia. This is a city which is going to have significant issues for the rest of our natural mm -hmm. lives. It is a city that needs leadership. And I'm really glad that Jaime pointed out the demise of business leadership in Los Angeles. For good or ill, Los Angeles for a number of years had policy that drove it. You knew where Los Angeles was coming from, you knew where it was headed, um, and to a remarkable extent, that, that system worked. This city needs leadership, and labor needs to be a part of that leadership. But when you become the leader, whether it's Antonio Villaragosa or labor, the focus then becomes that you are part of the problem or somehow you have to be part of the solution. And so, Julie, there, there's a sense right now from many sectors, no, I, I, though I don't think it's the majority, but uh, certainly you get it from the Daily News and others, that part of the problem that we have in this, this recession and part of the problem that the city of Los Angeles is having econo economically is the overwhelmingly favorable benefits that the city has bestowed upon unions because the unions have supported candidates like Richard Alarcon, who will be here in a second, who then feel beholden to you and to the unions to give you what you want, and therefore we get into trouble. Um, how do you respond to something? If it were like only that simple, mm -hmm. and it's not, and I think, I think, I think. Well, is, uh, but is there part of, is there some truth in what I'm saying? Um, I think. I think the city has been a very good employer. I think going back to the, um, to the Bradley days, I think the city has been a decent employer, never an excellent employer. Um, but uh, again, so the, my trash member, the guy that picks up your trash, earns about $60,000 a year. Uh, and he gets, for his family, Kaiser coverage. And that's for a long, he's been there on an average. Been there, well, if he's making 60000 that means he's been doing it for at least six years. So, and frankly, the city's not hiring. I think what's important is to make the distinction to some extent between power and influence. I, I think w where we've been successful is one where we're right. And I think that there's a, a, a presumption, labor in the city of Los Angeles cannot get anything done unless we're right. So where we can, where we can make an argument that actually is based in fact, um, where we can lead in a direction that actually is the right direction, um, I think we're, we've been able to prevail. Uh, the notion that, that we are all powerful and that politicians simply because we endorse them will do whatever we want obviously is not based in reality because you watch um, and they vote you know, 8 to 7, 14 to 1. Um, there are a lot of things, frankly, that we'd like to get done that we've been unable to get done. Um, that's not to say that we won't be there um, struggling. I, I, think, 
I actually think I heard one of our newest council members um, talk about the, the nature of adversity and that the best outcomes come from having people um, disagree, uh, kind of a spirited, litigated dispute that results in people coming to a conclusion. Um, what we found is that the, the best work that we've done um, at the shop level, for instance, um, is where literally people can yell at each other, figure out, again, I go back to trash, because I can always talk trash. Um, I grew up in New Jersey, I've watched The Sopranos. Um, <clears throat> we put, uh, early in the, in the early 90s, um, a fellow by the name of Richard Reardon was elected, and he was elected mayor on a platform of privatizing city services. One of the things he wanted to do was to contract out the picking up of trash. Um, and so literally, these trash guys got together and <clears throat> we put them in a room and had people yell at each other and, and sort of asked the, okay, if this were your business, how would you run it? How many guys would you have? How much trash would we pick, pick up? We came up with work standards. Um, they screamed at each other. The mechanics work in a different department and sort of all of the weirdness of the people that fix the trucks versus the people that drive the trucks. And they screamed at each other for days and they were pretty profound and profane. Um, you know, you couldn't keep a, keep a truck on the road if your life depended on it. The mechanics thought that the drivers were purposefully hurting the trucks to make overtime, you know, kind of all of those. And so literally people screamed at each other um, until they figured it out. And then we moved a whole bunch of mechanics to work on the night shift so that the trucks would be ready in the morning when they pick them up at 5 in the morning. We now have a 99% availability rate of the trucks. They figured that out themselves. They did work that management could never do, that the union institutionally could never do, that only the folks that actually understand how to pick up trash could figure out how we do that best. I think that's a powerful benefit for the city um, to have an engaged workforce that can truly figure out how we do what we do. Um, and so, you know, the first trash trucks that the city bought that were alternative fuel trucks, that were um, clean trucks, were way before any other city looked at them. And literally, we were in a position of advocating that shouldn't we perhaps wait for the technology to catch up where the trucks made it up the hill to the landfill. Um, but <clears throat> frankly, we found ourselves in a situation where we could not advocate for employees' right to breathe carcinogens. And so the city was way in advance of any other city in terms of um, moving and now literally two-thirds of the city's fleet of, of refuse trucks is alternative fuel vehicles. That was at the leadership of both the very conservative mechanics and drivers. Uh, and I think where people get outside of themselves is where they challenge what the best way to provide service is. Um, so I think that's been I think that's been really helpful for the city. And, and that's the, one of the most difficult areas to protect because uh, Julie explained to the students that in most cities. Um, though sanitation workers are actually not city employees, they're contracted out. And uh, there are 89 cities in, in LA County. How many cities actually employ their own sanitation workers? Probably about three or four. Right. Um, the city of Los Angeles, the city of Pasadena. And so everybody else is, in a sense, outsourced, and they're, they are private companies. And so they've made, made the, uh, most cities have not done what the city of LA has done. They've actually outsourced. Wally? Well, I think, thanks for that. I, I wanted to uh, follow up on uh, some of the things Julie was saying. Um, it got my mind racing in, in a somewhat different direction. We, we focused an awful lot on, on government and government employment and, and in unions and government for very good reason. I, I, the, the shifts have been massive and are very important. But the point I was making about leadership didn't uh, li limit itself to government. I want to give you one particular example of the way unions working with employers can provide leadership um, that is quite striking. Um, we've all heard about the importance of green jobs and making uh, a, a new workforce and a new kind of industry. That kind of stuff doesn't just happen uh, because it's a good idea and it drifts into being. Uh, one of the prominent unions here in town, Julie's well aware of, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBEW, yes, it's another acronym, has been... Kind of brotherhood. And brotherhood. <laughs> correct. Has looked forward to the, the possibility of green jobs for a number of years. And an old buddy of mine named Marv Kropke mm -hmm. at one of the locals here in town pioneered the creation, are you ready for this? A union created a school in which workers and others um, could, uh, union members and not, could learn the craft of the whole new green industry. So that was one of the first remarkable examples of leadership Marv did. The second thing that's going on is even more remarkable, and that is that the union finds itself now teaming up with companies in pursuit of work, 
and in pursuit of job creation. So that a union goes with a company and goes to the legislature or the politics or whatever and says as a unified voice, we can create a green industry if you take the following steps. So you have a union representative speaking, you have a company representative speaking, and what they're doing is they're providing a vision of where Los Angeles can go. They're leading. That's not elected office, it's not budgets, but it is real leadership. Yeah. I was actually gonna ask you this question before Councilman Alarcon showed up, but here he is, so I'm gonna have to <laughs> rephrase it. <clears throat> um. <laughs> it's gonna load up on you, man. <laughs> So let, let, me, let me introduce uh, Richard Alarcon. He is a city council member for, the district, for District 7, which is in the northeast part of Los Angeles, uh, up in the valley. Uh, before being council member, he was a state senator uh, up in Sacramento for eight years. And before that, he was a council member as well. So he went from being a council member in the city of Los Angeles up to being a state senator, and then he came back here to continue his service at the local level. And even before that, when I first met him, he was the representative for uh, Mayor Bradley uh, out in uh, out in the in in the valley, uh, I can go on and on about Council Member uh, uh, Richard Alcorn, all the type of legislation that he proposed and he sponsored while he was up in in the state uh, and everything that he's done here at the uh, local level. Let me just say that in 2005, Mr. Alcorn received the Truman Award for Outstanding Elected Official from the Democratic Party in the uh, San Fernando Valley. Uh, it's been a, a stalwart. Uh, uh, proponent for his district, the seventh district, and also for uh, for labor and, and for others. And we've been talking about labor, uh, and uh, we've been talking about the power of labor and, and the role that it plays. Um, let me ask the uh, before you, I, I uh, engage the council member is that um, what uh, Julie and and Wally, we know that labor and the city are gonna go through a couple of difficult years because of the budget crisis. And we're gonna ask the council member and Julie how their negotiations are going on and about the layoffs and all of that. We're gonna to get to that very specific. But assuming that in three years we get through this, okay, what is the greatest fear that you see for labor in three be, when we get past this? Um, and, and I say this in, in, from the following sense. Jaime talked about the void that occurred in that business stepped out of politics in the uh, mid-70s. And, and I have a theory about that. I, I believe that business was guarding against the emergence of Democrats, of labor, of, of minorities into politics. And, and, and they wanted to stay united to make sure that they drove the agenda because they knew what was best for Los Angeles. And, and, they, and they meant it, and they really meant that they were trying to do well for the city. Once Bradley got elected, a black liberal with some union backy, the world didn't end. As a matter of fact, things got, they were pretty well. And, and therefore, the resistance that business had, they kind of like, oh, they, they relaxed a little bit, they let their guard down, and really the chamber almost declined, and that's why you have the establishment of the Central Cities Association and VICA, because the chamber was so weak, I think it's been reemerged lately. Uh, and so you had this void. Is there a fear that labor will get complacent, that there's no more organizing schools, that, that, that labor will become a uh, fat cat once again uh, it, after we solve these, these, these different issues? What do you see for labor in the next five to 10 years? Well, beyond this recession era. Yeah. And, and then and I'm and after that, it will go. And, then, and, and treading into this territory, let me just make very clear, Julie speaks with the very real credential of being in the trenches, and I speak as a, an observer who at one time was and, and, and no longer is. Um, was and is what? <laughs> in the trenches. Oh, okay. I, I spent 17 years, 17 years in the union movement. Um, you know, I, I, I doubt that that is going to be the, the, the challenge for labor because uh, Los Angeles has had remarkable success in union organizing. Uh, we are at about the 12 percent level. Nationally, it is collapsing far beyond that. It's hitting eight, isn't it? About I now? think it's still in the 10 nationally, it's, but, but right. it's, go, it's going in the wrong direction. It's going in the wrong direction, and Los Angeles is, is bucking that trend. But we are going to be operating in that context, and that is an extremely difficult context uh, for us to operate in. The second thing I would observe is 
Um, we, and this is, this is moving from the local to the global, but there is a tremendous link. I've heard Richard uh, opine on this many, many times. The United States is running a colossal trade deficit, um, which makes it very, very difficult for working people in Los Angeles. Um, we had a lot of union members at one time because we were a manufacturing center uh, in which a colossal number of Los Angelinos were able to make very good livings, middle class livings, manufacturing things. That is increasingly difficult. So I would, I would guess that there are two challenges that will face labor when this particular crisis emerges, and that is the continuing national situation, which is not favorable, and the continuing international trade situation, which has not worked in our favor. Jaime. Bless you. Salud. Um, it, it's hard to imagine that labor would lose power uh, over, the next, uh, over the next decade. As long as it's doing what labor should be doing, and that's caring for its members and looking out for its members and its working force, um, it's going to need to be around. It's going to need to play a strong role in terms of helping those who govern the city, uh, govern it with labor and working families in mind. But it's also going to need collaborations. And Wally began to speak to some of that earlier. And I was at the LA Chamber installation dinner uh, a couple of months, about a month ago. Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce dinner held at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills. It uh, kind of didn't make sense, uh, and especially since I had to uh, come from Pasadena. It was just a kind of a surreal thing. But the outgoing uh, president of the LA Chamber, uh, Fran Inman, basically spent a lot of time uh, at the podium. Richard, I think you were in the audience that night, were you not? No. You could have said I, I yes, just, man. I just want to. <laughs> yeah, I was there. I, I want to let the students know that Fran Inman works for Majestic Realty. She does. That is owned by Roski, as in our Roski Dining Hall. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> that's a nice plug, man. I like that. Good one. Good one. Uh, so go and eat there. That's a good. We're going to go eat there. We're going to go with the students. Yeah, no choice. Actually, <laughs> 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 they're warning me. Oh boy. Yeah, that's why I'm taking you okay. to dinner okay. afterwards, okay. Jaime. Oh Roski. boy. <laughs> hey, that's a cut above, man. <laughs> Uh, that, would that would be a different restaurant, right? You live in Pasadena too, don't you? Uh, but at any rate, uh, what was good about being in the audience, I was a guest of Elise Buick in the United Way of Greater LA that evening with one of my staff members, was to hear uh, Fran talk about the points of collaboration between the LA Chamber and the LA County Federation of Labor. Muddy Elena was her guest sitting at the head table. Muddy Elena Durazo, who's the current executive uh, secretary treasurer of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. And there were three points uh, that Fran Inman addressed from the pulpit, and this was largely a business audience at the, in the Beverly Hilton that night. Uh, one point of collaboration was on the census. Another point of collaboration was around jobs and homelessness. And a third and more silent one that was aired that night but didn't carry legs uh, far beyond the hall was around term limits, battling term limits. And there is something afoot uh, between the LA County Federation of Labor and uh, the LA Chamber and perhaps other components of the larger community, not only of LA City and County, but the state, uh, to try to get some reform on the June ballot uh, that would be, in some sense, an expansion of what, or at least a reformed expansion of what term limits is is uh, is today. So I think that is probably then, the so future. It, is term limits really that critical to the future of labor? I think they feel it is because they're seeing seeing a leadership vacuum as well, where you get a Richard uh, Alarcon in the state senate that can't be there for 12 years. Uh, they want to work with experienced hands as well as anybody. Business does too. And that's where the common alignment uh, is shaping up and taking place. Yeah, but I would make the argument that term limits actually helped unions institutionalize their power. I, th for I think that personally my observation has been that term limits has been very good for unions in terms of driving <coughs> the interest of politicians in m politicians that wouldn't have otherwise talked to us. Nonetheless, I think that term limits have been horrible for the people. Um, and whatever little advantage we gain in having politicians that are interested in talking to unions, I think is way overshadowed by the <clears throat> increased transactionalness of the, of the politics. 
<clears throat> I think the having long-term committed folks with a sense, with year-to-year -year sense of how a budget works um, is way more important and more beneficial to all Los Angeles folks in Los Angeles um, without regard to whether they're members of unions. Um, I think it's one of those kind of sneaky things that turns out to have been a real mistake. So, uh, moments, my opinion. Do, uh, Julie, you, in, in the union movement, you guys do strategic planning for the long term. I know you're dealing with a lot of specific stuff right now, but is there something that keeps you guys up at night when you think about it over the next three to five years? Well, I mean, I think big picture, and it's not, I actually don't think all that much I don't get time to think big picture, but I think you're absolutely right. I, until there's manufacturing, until I saw a small increase in the statistics for manufacturing jobs in Los Angeles for the first time, it's like a point something or other, um, but it was the first increase. Un until people go back to work making things, I, I don't know that we're going to really see a real recovery. Um, on the other hand, I, I think now more than ever, the divide between the richest and the poorest is so dramatic that there's always going to be a need for somebody to speak on behalf of workers. Um, I think it's funny, I live in, actually in Highland Park, which is considered a working class neighborhood, and it's one of the only times that you hear people talking about class, is when they refer to a neighborhood as a working class neighborhood. Um, otherwise, we don't talk about class, and I think somebody has to speak for the working class. Yeah. Um, when we've talked about this before in terms of industrialization in Los Angeles, if you take a look back in the 1950s and you would start on the, uh, in Long Beach on the 710 freeway, drive up, go to the five and go down the five to the Orange County line, that's roughly about 25 miles and you would take two miles on each side of that freeway and take those 50 square miles. That alone was the 35th largest economy in the world in the 1950s based mostly on industrial jobs. The Todd shipyards in Long Beach, uh, the GM plant, Studebaker, the Uniroyal plant, um, and symbolically, the Uniroyal plant is now a mall, which is that beautiful Assyrian facade as you, citadel. yeah, the, the Citadel, right. Um, Richard, you, you've, dealt with, you've dealt with this specifically, the decline of those type of jobs. So let me ask you two questions, specifically to the first one to, uh, around the GM plant in Van Nuys that you were very much involved with in terms of it closing down. And actually closing down, oh, it, no. was, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. It closed down before I was in office. Okay. Yeah, but in terms <laughs> of what to do, right? no, but in terms of what to do with that property and then how to create employment. Yeah. And, and, and the difficulty I have is we all, we all say we need to create more manufacturing jobs in Los Angeles. There's a consensus, everybody, on that. But what are those jobs? I well, disagree. What, you, you want less manufacturing jobs? No. You want uh, no jobs? No, I think we need to be, <laughs> I think we need to be focused on high paying jobs. High and, paying uh, jobs. Uh, the, there, uh, when, you, when you, actually, the research tells you that uh, manufacturing has not shrunk by that much. What has shrunk is, is heavy manufacturing, which pays high wages, versus uh, light manufacturing, which pays low wages. Uh, so we've seen a growth in light manufacturing, uh, shrinkage in heavy manufacturing, and that's exactly what happened at the General Motors plant. Uh, we, we were able to retain 50% of the property with manufacturing, uh, and we were able to focus on a, on a couple of manufacturers that have high wages, but the bulk of the property has transitioned now into low-paying uh, jobs. Another mall. Parts, parts um, of it's a mall. But so, and, th and that is replicated all over the country, by the way. and so. Uh, but I want to, I want to, I, I need to address, I want to address that question too. Oh, go ahead. Everybody else answered the you question. Have, I want to answer Pretend the you're on the city council yeah, and the, you can talk about anything. The question about whether, the, <laughs> yeah, I will. The, the question about whether to, uh, uh, whether the, the labor will, will be empowered after this, this crisis really is a question for the people. Because the, what, what, what I see happening as our economy has contracted, uh, the anger of the populace has increased, the cynicism of the populace has increased, and, and that cynicism is directed at all the institutions, including uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the profit-making uh, profit sector and the, uh, the unions. <clears throat> so the question moving forward is who, who is going to garner su the support of that cynical base uh, as we move forward to correct uh, our, our contracted economy our, our, we all know that our economy will grow, uh, but the question is who is going to push it? Uh, labor and, and uh, 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 developers will, will move uh, an agenda forward to grow our economy. But what I'm talking about is, is 
who is going to uh, who who is going to get the blame? Let me give you one specific example because this just occurred uh, a, a week and a half ago. I, I uh, was successful in getting a motion uh, unanimously passed by the city council to put banking responsibility measures uh, in effect that would uh, allow us to divest from banks that we don't think are acting responsible uh, responsibly as to how they're investing our taxpayer dollars in the local community. You mean divest that the city would take its own money out of those banks? We would take our deposits, just like if you didn't like the bank branch manager, like I don't like my branch manager over at uh, the bank in Sun Valley. Um, I've never you, heard of the Bank of Sun Valley. You decide, the, uh, no, it's Chase Bank. Oh. But <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't like your, your, your bank, you say, well, I'm going to move my money over here. Well, I think the city of Los Angeles has to make those same decisions. It needs to be a simple transaction. Either you're providing services to our community or you're not. But here's the interesting thing. Um, the Service Employees International Union is uh, working with me because this is a national uh, organizational campaign that they have taken up because they know that the public is very angry at the banks. Mm -hmm. They believe they spent the TARP money inappropriately, that they did not invest in uh, small businesses and, and other uh, and foreclosure, uh, to address the foreclosure crisis and the, the uh, grow small businesses. And so the point is that, that, that I believe there's going to be a trend and, and a backlash against the banks uh, to continue this. In fact, I just got a call today from uh, Denver where a city councilman wants to introduce the same exact motion over there. And so the, the question is, who is going to garner the, po the, the support of the populace in, in, in terms of gaining their trust and moving forward? And I happen to think that labor will remain strong because ultimately they're the ones that are going to fight for, uh, to take health care off the agenda by virtue of providing for everybody. They're the ones that are going to fight for those people who are now going broke because they lost their house. They're the ones that are going to fight for uh, the better wages. Uh, and they're the ones that are going to push projects that create more jobs. Uh, and, and so I think there will, uh, there will be a consistent message from the other side uh, to, uh, to try and, uh, and diminish that effort, Who, who's but the I believe who's, that that is not going to be as substantive. Yeah, who's the other side? I think banking and insurance companies are, are primary in, in terms of, uh, of, of suppressing uh, labor interests. And in California, uh, California has always been strongest when labor was strongest. I mean, we, we, uh, our construction industry is, is tied to labor. Uh, we've, we've succeeded with our development. Uh, our educational system is union, and, and we have one of the best uh, uh, systems in the nation. By the way, my daughter graduated from Loyola last uh, summer, Loyola Law, and she's a public works commissioner. Thank you very much. I love you guys. <laughs> and, um, you you and just love us because you're not lo paying tuition anymore. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, and, and, and uh, another industry, wow. another industry that is, well. Another, indus another industry that's an anchor to California is the film industry, and, and that's a union industry. So I think California has done very well by labor, and, and it will continue to grow as people realize that those are the people that are going to fight for them. Okay, you have some very tough decisions to make. You, the city, we mentioned already, the city faces $200 million budget deficit in its current fiscal year, meaning 09-10. Uh, a forecasted $500 million budget next year. Uh, revenues are declining. Um, and on the table to balance this budget has been to cut 4,000 jobs. All of them union, I believe, right? And not necessarily. Not ne but the vast majority of them, vast probably. Majority. Uh, on the other hand, peop uh, h how are you dealing with it? How, how, how you, are, are you going to support this? And you haven't in been supporting this, but how is this going to resolve itself? How does somebody oh. support uh, putting 4,000 people out of a, a job? Majority of it's, your it's, uh, the majority of your colleagues supported yeah, that. I, well, <laughs> they supported uh, eliminating 4,000 jobs, but they did not uh, uh, support uh, uh, laying off 4,000 people. There's a, uh, you know, if we can move people into positions that aren't relying on the general fund, we can save a lot of those jobs. I, I have explain that to the students. There's yeah. the general fund, and then there are other. <laughs> The general fund is, is where the shortfall exists, but we have other funds. So, for example, you pay your, your water and power bill. Water and power is separate and distinct from our city's general fund. That's where Wally gets his paycheck. From. Nevertheless, if there, are, if there are job openings at the Department of Water and Power, we can move city employees into those job openings, avoid layoffs at the city side at the same time, uh, providing them uh, Honestly, employment. Julie, how many positions does that take care of? If we move people to the, the 
port, the LAX, Department of Water and Power, I don't know, the CRA off the general budget? What do, you, what do we get, 300 jobs? Oh, it depends no, on no, who's no, counting. No, 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 no there's no, tremendous okay, you count. opportunity. No, 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 no. I'll huh? just give you an example. The airport department is a proprietary department. Before we paid for thousands of people to retire, they had 300 vacancies. They had 222 people retire. So I don't know, my math says that's a couple hundred jobs just there. We think there's tremendous opportunity to be more efficient about how the city delivers work. Um, frankly, we just agreed to cover the cost of retiring out 2,400 of the most senior, highest paid, least likely to be delivering direct service. The 4,000 layoffs that are being contemplated, proposed by the mayor, um, are really cuts at the front line of folks delivering direct service. Um, those folks tend to be the lowest paid folks and tend to be the last hired in the city, which is why they're in danger of being laid off. Um, we think there are tremendous opportunities to cut the bureaucracy, to collect more money, um, to increase revenue. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna, the last thing on earth, uh, that makes sense Julie, right can I now. ask you to get the mic a little bit closer oh, to I'm you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. usually so loud that I don't even usually <laughs> need one. Um, but <laughs> It's just that we're recording it, so <laughs> it, it, it helps. Because we, we want to, whatever you say, we want to send it to Antonio Villaragosa and make sure. That <laughs> so we can start with the layoffs in, uh, no, I'm, <laughs> I couldn't even do that right. Um, no, obviously we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, but wait a minute, 4,000, okay. It still doesn't cover 200 million plus 500 million, that's 700 million dollars. And so the mayor, the pro-labor mayor, did your union endorse him for, uh, in 2005? In 2005, no. Mm, okay. Um, but, but with that said, um, we believe that actually this mayor for the first year of his term did exactly what the city needed. We needed a mayor that was everywhere and all things to all people. Um, I, think, I think part of what's going on is, is that since then, uh, he sort of disappeared. I mean, I think the, the job of running a city, of managing a city as the mayor, is a really tough job uh, that requires a lot of hands-on paying attention. Uh, and that ne that's what needs to happen. There, there's still a possibility now that we can keep everybody working um, if everybody gets to work the way that, that uh, the council member to my left has been. So what is the proposal then to uh, balance the budget if we don't do the 4,000 as the mayor has proposed and a majority of your colleagues have theoretically supported. As you, as you correctly stated, the 4,000 job cuts will not be the bulk of uh, reductions that are necessary to close the $600 million gap. So we're doing a lot of other things uh, and uh, it, a lot of it is diminished services, uh, diminished service level. So people next year and very soon will start beginning to see that that our services rendered by recreation and parks, our tree trimming, our, our street services, all of those services will uh, start diminishing. Um, but, th so, so there will be some in, in terms of just the, the service delivery. And we're, we're exploring everything from selling uh, properties uh, to, um, to moving employees into other functions. But we also have to try, uh, what, what you, you, you sort of couch this as if I'm on the other side. Uh, what I am on the side of is clarity. Uh, when we talk about uh, 4,000 layoffs, and I voted against that motion, not because uh, I don't recognize that, that we have a challenge to avoid layoffs, but I don't know where those cuts are going to be. I don't know which positions they're talking about. I don't know which services they're talking about. And before I sign on, uh, I want to know what's going to ha I want the public to know what services are going to be. That's exactly cut. what I'm trying to get at, because I mean, <coughs> I study this stuff and I read everything, and I'm not clear on what that, but, but what, to, what it's I wanna, going on. I want to tell you just, uh, I believe that we can create more than a thousand jobs by moving people into existing vacant positions in the Harbor Airport and DWP. I believe that we can be more aggressive on the ERA grants from the, federal, the stimulus grants from, from uh, the Obama administration. I don't think we have focused our energy on job creation with those grants. For example, the library department just uh, uh, in, in an effort to address the digital divide applied for a grant of 700 million dollars from the federal government uh, and uh, and it only created one job uh, it's great that we created the technology to to, uh, to uh, uh, get minority and, and poor communities connected uh, to literacy uh, on the other hand what good does it do if the doors of the library are going to be closed right. So they should have focused on, on uh, one of the Obama administration's top priority, job creation, as part of that package. And, and, so, and in fact, they were very apologetic that they didn't. And to their credit, uh, when they applied for this, 
they had no anticipation about the 4,000 layoffs. But nevertheless, I think we have to make a much more aggressive effort to get stimulus dollars to create city, uh, city uh, uh, services or to retain city services that are going to be lost. Uh, at the end of the day, if there are no concessions from labor, I recognize that there, there is a very high likelihood that there will be layoffs. Um, but the, what, what, what I don't like, and I've been in, in city government since 1981, what I don't like is the nature of the, the negotiation process. Uh, there it, is, it, is, uh, it is sort of a, a very dangerous game of chicken, and it is not based on trust. Last year, we got out of this problem because labor offered up significant givebacks uh, to the extent that we reduced our workforce by 2,400 people, uh, they're uh, contributing more to the pension system. They took, uh, they 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 uh, gave back raises that were secured for three years ahead. They gave them back. Uh, they gave significant benefits. And and what did we do? We turned around and said, "That's not enough. We're we're going to lay you off." As opposed to saying, "What other ideas do you have?" And and it's the, it's the nature of the negotiation process that I think has diminished the opportunities for us to save jobs, save services, uh, and reduce the the uh, the need for for as many layoffs. So we get a sense of what you would like to see happen. What do you think is going to happen? What what I think is going to happen is I, I think the mayor is going to is going to push for the increase in the water rates, uh, uh, frankly, to generate uh, seventy million dollars uh, in uh, additional transfers from DV, DWP uh, that will help us uh, create more jobs. Now I've opposed the transfer historically, but um, but the point is that that, that that's seventy a seventy million dollar gap that would be filled. Uh, in addition, we we will pursue a sale of certain facilities. Uh, and, and frankly, some of the facilities, uh, there is no dispute between uh, uh, labor. Uh, I think we, we may be in a situation where we have to uh, stall the hiring of police officers. Uh, right now, we can retain our workforce, uh, our police uh, sworn officer workforce at 9,100 if we, if we do not hire another police officer all next year, and that will save us about $50 million. Um, so it's going to be a series of major uh, uh, holes that are plugged by each of these, uh, these endeavors. And by the way, all the 4,000, uh, we've already uh, created jobs for, for many hundreds of people, more than 300, and there's more that are being negotiated each day. In fact, uh, you know, I mentioned my daughter. She personally has saved uh, about 200 jobs uh, as we speak, and she's uh, trying to get more. And I think other general managers will have that opportunity as long as they focus. And some, quite frankly, are focusing more than others. Yeah, um, you just brought this up, so I'm going to have um Wally Knox, who is the Director of External oh, Affairs here we go. at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. That's uh, Speaking of which. Yeah. <laughs> he, uh, the mayor has currently proposed a surcharge, as the council member mentioned. The LA Times wrote an editorial saying they like the broad idea but don't like the process. Can you explain to the students what is going on? So what is being proposed? Okay, and what what uh, what is the LA Times talking about? Sure. Um, let me just sort of do a, a quick check here. How many folks have heard that DWP is discussing a rate increase? And, and, and be honest, if you've heard about it, let me know. Okay, how many folks have not heard about that at all? Okay, so it's kind of 50-50 on that. <clears throat> Um, so the ones that are heard are those that live off campus and pay DWP. That's those that haven't heard live on campus and don't care. Wally, Wally, uh, Wally, I want to ask him another. Wally, attention. Wally, I want to ask him another question. Yeah. How many of you believe that we need to move from our reliance on fossil fuels <laughs> and move toward uh, alternative fuel energy? Well, who, d who does it? <laughs> okay, thank you. Good point. <laughs> Even if it costs more. Even if it costs more. Okay, some hands went down. Depends on how much. <laughs> it's a tough question. And the questions Richard just asked you are exactly the questions we have been asking ourselves and City Council has been asking itself and the mayor has been asking us for quite some time. The, the background, and I'll try to do this quickly, the background is, is pretty simple. 40% of the energy that powers that light right now comes from a plant in Utah that is coal-fired and is spewing out pollution and carbon dioxide throughout the state of Utah. 
There are, you know, it's located there because there are not a lot of people, but I was raised in New Mexico. I'm very familiar with the Navajo tribes and the, the Indian tribes. They live there, and that site was selected by Los Angeles because of its remoteness, but still there are that, human That's pretty cool. There. The city of LA wants energy, so it goes way out to Utah and creates a polluting place so that, hmm. Brings in 40% of our energy, not, not, not 90%, but 40% of our energy is coal. There are few Los Angelinos who want that to be the vision of Los Angeles in the future. On top of that, it's entirely likely that there's going to be some kind of a cap and trade, which is another way of saying the cost of using that coal is going to become dramatically, dramatically more expensive. Artificially <coughs> because the federal government will charge you anyway. State government under AB 32 or the federal government uh, under prospective legislation would say we must transition from coal and we are going to find a way of making coal. So you're far saying more that the, a surcharge is coming one way or the other. And you must look ahead and adapt to that. This city is, is colossal. We cannot overnight move from 40% of our electricity generated uh, by coal to uh, renewable energy directed by, uh, generated by solar or wind. It is a complex, agonizingly difficult process. I hate, to, I hate to tell the bad news. It's not easy, it cannot be done overnight, and it will result in increased, increases in the amount of money it takes to do the, the transition. So that, DWP, that, go that, ahead. That DWP bill is pretty big. I mean, it's a large bill when you get it. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult to pay. What are we going to do about people who really can't afford to pay, Richard? I mean, who, a great question. you know, how, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna manage that? Could I lead and, and do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. I mean, what, what do you do That's about That's the only that? kind of questions we ask here at Loyola Marymount University. <laughs> Tough questions. You know, you say, you say to Brentwood or the West Los Angeles that your DWP bill is going to go up. Five dollars a month, two dollars a month, something of that sort, and and it's it's a manageable kind of thing. You go to other parts of this town and tell people, including who district. are working for a living hard and are having a really hard time of keeping things together, and talk about those kinds of increases. It's incredibly difficult. What you do is this: you tier your bill so that large energy users, guess who those folks are going to be? Large energy users are. Uh, sold electricity at a much higher rate than uh, folks who do not use a tremendous amount of electricity. And those folks are typically the folks who need a break on their rates. And that is what DWP uh, is working on. And just today, the commission met uh, to discuss tiering the rates even further so that people who live in impoverished sections of the town will pay a, a radically lower um, rate than folks in other parts of the town. That is the attempt. It is not 100% perfect in the sense that folks who at the first tier level will pay a little bit more than they currently are paying. Um, but it is a dramatic step in what I think is the right direction on how to handle the rate increases. And what was if, the if LA I could Times, answer, you, let me ask, what was the LA yeah. Times um, complaining about in terms of the process of how the, the, this was handled? You know, I think the Times is very concerned that the, the process is really hard to understand. And I, I can't blame the LA Times and I can't blame friends of mine who complained about the process for that. It is absolutely agonizing. In other to words, no, no one's really seen, I mean, earlier council member Alarcon talked about how difficult it is to try to vote on something that talks about 4,000 jobs he doesn't know where they are and all that. We're talking about the surcharge and nobody's really seen the plan until today. To, to council's credit, you know, th this is getting into the, the murky waters of detail. Back in August, you know, last August, uh, the Department of Water and Power went to city council and essentially said, if, if I may be so bold, give us a blank check. Um, we, don't, we, we know kinda where we're going we know kind of how much it will cost, and just let us charge whatever the heck it takes us to get there. Um, council, to its enormous credit, said, uh-uh, we're not gonna let you do that. On top of that, we are gonna demand That's putting that it very politely. I, I put it very delicately. I think stronger <laughs> words were used. 
And on top of that, council, again, to its credit, said we need an independent outside group to come in. We hire them, not DWP. DWP pays for it, thank you very much. But we hire them, we direct them, <laughs> we tell them what to do, and we want an analysis of where DWP should be going, how much that is going to cost, and is the rate uh, justified. They came back with a report. Richard, when was that? About uh, two weeks now. It's been, it's been public. Something, something on the order of two. He, he hasn't seen it. We, LA Times hasn't seen it. Oh, no, no the, the, it's, it's, it's out there. It's, okay. it, it, it let is me just, out there. Uh, remind, and, and but, but if I could answer your yeah, question, let me, Fernando, let me just because. just remind everybody yeah. that we're looking at, uh, we're here at Loyola Marymount University, the <laughs> Urban Lecture <laughs> Studies Series, uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, Levy Center for the Study of, of Los Angeles. And we have with us uh, Mr. Wally Knox, uh, Professor Jaime Regalado, Ms. Julie Butcher, and Council Member Richard Alarcón talking about the role of labor in Los Angeles. And we're going to get some comments from uh, the Council Member right now in response to what Mr. Knox said. And then we're going to have some of the students ask some uh, penetrating questions, especially if they want extra credit. Um, yeah, I, really, I really am not responding to Wally because I think his, his response was, was accurate. But I think the way that you should look at it is, uh, honestly, what will occur is that uh, the DWP, how many of you have a DWP bill? How many of you uh, don't understand your DWP bill? Okay, I want those of you that do understand it to come and explain it to me because I do not understand it. It's very complicated and part of the, uh, part of the success of the Department of Water Power to continue to increase rates has been because they have created confusion on their bill, uh, not, not solely because uh, they intended to, but because we have imposed so many additional charges on that bill that have nothing to do with the Department of Water and Power. In fact, almost double uh, the amount of the bill is, is not related to Department of Water and Power, sanitation service charges and all kinds of other things. So there's, there's a, a certain confusion and, and because of the, the underlying uh, general distrust and cynicism that our society has right now, uh, since people are confused and they can't figure out their bill, they assume that it's cynical, and that it's uh, sinister. And so, so, uh, so what will happen is, uh, naturally, the city will, will try to find the way to, to reduce the confusion, reduce the, the pain, if you will, and that's why uh, Mr. Knox has painted it as $5 a, a bill. Now, and in doing so, what we're, what we're, so, so what we're doing is we're trying to reduce the harm on each individual that has to pay the bill. The second thing that will occur is a massive marketing scheme to get people to refocus on, on, uh, on alternative and re uh, renewable energy as our primary goal. And, and I think the people of Los Angeles are very much in support of that. They just don't realize how much it costs. One of the concerns that the council has to take up, and it's, it's my concern, is if we're the first into this market, then it's going to be the most expensive energy because, uh, because companies will not invest in, in developing what we need in terms of renewable sources uh, because it's very costly. So the first people out of the gate are going to have to pay the most. So the question is not only uh, how can we uh, um, uh, sell the, the uh, renewable, energies to fo uh, renewable energy to folks, but at the same time, how can we do so in a package that over time will reduce the stress on, on your budgets? But frankly, real leadership uh, is about uh, betting. A and, uh, and the mayor is placing a major bet that this is going to work. Uh, because, frankly, he is uh, about working on his legacy at this point, and that means that he believes that by doing this, that we will, in fact, gain tremendous benefits by reducing our reliance on fossil uh, uh, fuels. And if, if he's successful, his success may not be felt in the next year or two, uh, but down the road, history will show that it, it was the right decision. That's, that's what I think the mayor is doing, and the council will try to balance all of that and, and do something very similar. Are you in favor of this? I, ha I haven't finally decided. I, my staff is looking into it in great detail. They've been briefed. I've been briefed. Uh, but what's your gut tell you? My gut tells me that at the end of the day, uh, the, the board will approve the, uh, the increase to some extent and, and uh, divvy it up uh, in a variety of ways. Um, I will obviously, as I have historically, fight to protect 
the people who have the least ability to pay. I created the, the uh, low-income uh, 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 review committee in, uh, of the PUC when I was a senator, and I've, I've done some of the same things on the city council. Uh, but that also means that that means other people are going to have to pay a little bit more. And, and so uh, all of those, so I think something will pass, but it, it's not going to be necessarily anything that it looks like now. Questions out there? Anybody? Yeah, in the meantime, while you guys make your way over to the uh, microphone, there's several of you, um, I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Alarcon, former State Senator Alarcon, um, what's the toughest vote that you have ever taken? <laughs> toughest vote, wow. wow. That's, uh, you know, uh, I've like been in office, office. this is my 18th year in office, uh -huh. and I probably voted, uh, 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 you know, 20,000 times. That's because you leave the button automatically up according to the LA Times. Well, it, it's true, and, and we wouldn't do that if we, if we thought the item was something we, we uh, need to vote no. Toughest on. vote. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of one in particular well, we're gonna, because we're there have been so them. many. We're going to let the students yeah. ask some questions, and then I'm going to come back at the end and ask you about your toughest vote. Uh, uh, this question is for all. Your, your name. Uh, my name is Mandela Bunty. I'm a junior, said that last time. Um, with the belief that labor unions uh, create market imperfections in our market and uh, the perception that it's a socialist idea, how do you guys believe, think that your fight is going to last in our current situation? So let me ask the most socialist person on this panel. Um, hmm. Hi, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hey. No, I don't know about that. I don't well, well, know. first of all, the assumption of the question, market imperfections, <laughs> and that it's a socialist idea. Well, I'll, I'll no, jump I in. I, I'm, you know, that's, that's a loaded now, question. I don't, know, I don't know why he's asking that question, because he's like a, a, a liberal. Uh, <laughs> he's, um, he's first of all, I don't, I don't uh, uh, assume uh, the market imp uh, imperfection implication. Uh, the fact of the matter is that when capitalism emerged uh, and, and, and the, what, what I call the new corporatism uh, emerged, uh, initially uh, corporations were established on the basis of social benefit. In other words, you could not establish a corporation un unless you could define the social benefit that was accrued uh, to the public. Uh, over time, they've whittled down uh, the laws uh, to move away from social benefit and focus on profit for their investors. Uh, so the, you can even read An Andrew Carnegie, who will tell you that if capitalism is going to be successful, it has to be regulated. So I see uh, the labor unions as a form of regulation uh, to regulate the balance of, of profiteering with the, the social needs to improve the quality of life for the masses of people in, in, uh, in the country, as opposed to just the few. Now, we, we were the strongest in that regard in the 50s and 60s, uh, but we have diminished uh, in that and have expanded the gap between the have and the have-nots uh, ever since. And, and uh, I think that, that the, uh, the crisis in our economy is a reflection of that greed. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, I believe unions are, are, are essentially uh, trying to, to reduce the, the, the natural tendency to greed uh, of, of greed and spread the benefits of the general production of, of, of folks. Now, I don't think that takes away from the opportunities to create profit uh, and allow some uh, groups and, and individuals to make more, uh, but, uh, uh, but some people call that socialism, and that's not my definition of socialism. Wow, Richard, you sound more like a professor than Jaime and I do. <laughs> uh, well, listen, Your if, if socialism, socialism brought us an eight-hour workday, public education, uh, Medicare, and uh, Social Security, and perhaps uh, universal health care. What's wrong with socialism? I'm for it. So you're a socialist? Huh? I'm a socialist. OK. He's got tenure. That's why you can say that. I can say uh, that. <coughs> what is, what's your definition of socialism? Me? Definition of socialism. Um, well, I think I think uh, the, it, where, where uh, the total uh, uh, product of, of production is controlled by a central government. Uh, and, and I don't believe we have anything near that. Uh, and I don't believe there are many unions that are calling for anything like that. Um, by and large, unions are partners with, uh, with uh, uh, organizations that, that need 
profit to thrive because uh, they need for those companies to thrive in order for them to be able to pay better wages. So uh, I, I don't think we have anything near uh, a socialism uh, problem with the development of unionization. Thank you guys all for coming. I learned a lot tonight. Uh, my question is for Ms. Butcher, and it's about unions. Um, I feel like there are a lot of people who work really, really hard and still aren't able to provide a visible quality of life for their families or make a fluid transition to retirement. And I know you talked about how now like trash workers are making up to 60000 a year and they're able to have health care provided for their families. Um, do you think that those benefits span all union workers currently? And do you see that expanding in the near future? And also, do you think that there are enough people in politics with union interests at heart to make that happen as soon as possible? Julie, why don't we have you address that? I mean, I, I'm always well, optimistic. I, I don't think I would work as hard as I do on what I do if I were not, if I did not believe that ultimately um, we tilt towards justice. I think it's, I think that's why people organize also um, out of out of the need to provide the basics. Uh, I think what we're seeing right now is, is an attempt to sort of pit people against each other and, and somehow this kind of spiral to the bottom. And I don't think that benefits anybody. I, I think some of what Richard was talking about is historically in this country there, there was a, a compact between industry, between business and the workers that kind of we all, we all go down together, we all come up together. Um, and now if you look at the tremendous difference between CEO salaries and the average worker's salary, I mean the fact is is that people don't need to be wealthy, they need to support their families as you say. Um, so you know, I remind people all the time that the average city worker when they retire earns, if they've worked 30 years, $30,000, $33,233 a year. Um, that and they don't get paid social, don't pay in and participate in social security. Um, it seems to me that we could probably agree at least at a minimum of what people people should have health care. People should have the opportunity to send their kids to school. Um, we should have a, a quality way of living. I don't think anybody thwarts the idea that somebody could get very very rich, um, but I don't know how rich they have to be to, uh, on, to contrast that folks should have at least um, a, a minimum way of living and. Many times, when people don't aren't able to support their family, the fact is is that they're 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 much happier working as opposed to putting their hand out for somebody else's assistance. Um, people want to work. Uh, my experience is that people don't go to work thinking, "Boy, I'm going to screw up today." Um, I think people want to be passionate about what they do. I think people want to be able to support their family, and I think it is humiliating when people can't um, support their families. So I want to thank my favorite council member, at least until next week when Jan Perry's here, uh, <laughs> Richard, Richard Alaricone. Wow, what a standard. <laughs> uh, director of SEIU Local 721, Julie Butcher, Wally Knox, and of course, Professor Jaime Regalado. Thank you very much. Thank you.